Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 715. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today is February 1st, 2022. All right, welcome to another program of Anglican Unscripted. And yes, I have escaped the Bombo Genesis. Uh, Jill and I hopped on a plane last night, flew down here to Florida, where it is noticeably warmer. It's going to be 71 degrees today. Uh, we don't have to wear our polar uh, jackets or gloves or hats. We don't have to run out to the car and start it to warm it up before we get into it. However, for people who are native to Florida, 71 degrees is still polar weather, George. Yes, it's only going to be 71 today, Kevin, so I've got my wool blazer and my wool trousers, and I've got the heat on in the office, and uh, hopefully in a few months we'll be back up to the mid-80s, 100% humidity, and I'll be happy again. It's odd that climate is so subjective. Oh, well, this global warming, climate change, very subjective. Uh, let's talk about the news. We started last week's program talking about uh, Bishop Todd Hunter from the ACNA. He's in charge of... Uh, Church for the Sake of Others Diocese out in California. Well, it's kind of one of those non-geographical dioceses as well. And how they're, they're kind of embracing wokeism and critical race theory to an uncomfortable, dare I say, almost heretical level. And we addressed it here in the program. We got lots of feedback. And I got feedback from sources not inside the ACNA, but really close to the ACNA that says, um, Archbishop Foley Beach has called for a conclave to occur where he wants the House of Bishops, College of Bishops, to um, come to, I'm not going to tell you where, uh, a location uh, somewhere in maybe near the Diocese of South Carolina after the uh, consecration of Chip Edgars. And I thought, well, we need to talk about this because I don't think it was a response to what we did last week, but it certainly is something that needs to happen. And it's a difficult topic to hold uh, uh, another bishop accountable for such a, a nouveau theory, critical race theory. And I think in, in future shows, certainly before uh, the conclave, we will have to you know, dissect uh, critical race theory a little bit more thoroughly for the listener to understand and maybe be instructional for the bishops of the ACNA. But that's quite a turnaround, George. We were, we were a little hopeless last week. It's good to hear this, this news. Well, the uh, ACNA bishops had their meeting in recently in Melbourne, Florida, and much of that was taken up with the situation in the upper nor upper uh, Midwest diocese and Todd Atkinson, the uh, bishop of in uh, Canada. Mm -hmm. And not as much time was spent on concerns some bishops have over the uh, progressive uh, views of the church C4SO. And we mentioned how the Reformed Episcopal Church has really been quite strong in saying, look, we, we've really got to have this settled. Well, we've been told, uh, not officially, but unofficially, that on March 12th, Chip Edgars will be consecrated a Bishop Coadjutor of South Carolina. And Archbishop Beach is asking everybody, the bishops, to stay for a private meeting afterwards at Camp Christopher, the South Carolina Conference Center. And he's hoping to get 90% of the bishops there. So we really do have a, I don't want to say quorum, because technically you don't need 90%, but so that really do have a mind of the church as a whole meeting to basically get rid of all the misconceptions and the muck and the questions and basically have people talk straight to each other rather than through people like Kevin and George uh, <laughs> saying things about saying things about the other side that we repeat second third hand so the uh, Foley Beach I think has jumped on this is fairly quickly for an institution to not to this is not a meeting to slam C4SO no and this that's not is what a we meeting want. this is where we offer you know the thought of a CNA regarding critical race theory and maybe they could release that uh, report on racism and race that was submitted to them by the the uh, the committee they put together that that exists I have a copy um, I'm not gonna release it yet because I promise not to but maybe the ACNA would want to release that as well because it's all relate it's all related to this you know so 
Um, now, some people may want groups within the ACNA to come to blows and beat each other up and get bloodied and walk out. Uh, we have no uh, dog in that particular fight. And, and from time to time, people do try to use us to advance their own agendas by giving us information that we run with. But I think in this case, we are having a meeting that's going to be held in private to allow a full airing of differences, grievances, concerns, and clean up misconceptions. Because it's, it's so easy to get things very wrong. And I think the bishops of the ACNA need to get together and get this thing sorted out. So good for the ACNA to have this uh, move. Now, and I hope COVID doesn't kill it. Yeah, I hope it, you need to encourage your bishop to go. Uh, because Archbishop Foley has said, I want 90% or the conclave's off. So he wants 90% that's what, of the, That's what we're told. That's he what we're told. He didn't tell us that. No. <laughs> I don't have a direct line to Archbishop Foley, um, although I have his number somewhere. But, you know, here's the reality. You want to encourage your bishop to attend, especially if you're concerned about how wokeism is slowly uh, seeping evilly into the church and it's becoming a new gospel within the church and it's replacing our gospel with the Gnostic gospel of wokeism. So just encourage your bishop to attend. Email, call the office, buy a plane ticket, whatever you need to do, you want your, your bishop to be there. Um, George, I think that's kind of covering the first story here. Um, got that, got that, encourage Richard 90%. Got, got, got. All right, so now on to some very sad news. Um, you and I are forced to report on uh, Christian persecution around the world because it occurs so frequently. Um, it's not something that occurs once a month or once a week. It's, it's a daily thing now. Uh, more Christians have died in the last 100 years than died in the previous uh, 1900 years. Uh, martyrs and people persecuted for their, their beliefs in Jesus Christ. I saw you post a story about a Pakistani priest who was uh, killed by machine gun fire. And I, I hate to read that stuff, George. That, that just breaks my heart because we're offering not an alternative, we're offering uh, a true religion that transforms. And some people think it's just a, a competition you can just knock off. And if you shoot it and kill it, it will go away. We've proven over 2,000 years that you can't kill Christianity, so please stop trying. What's the story of Pakistan, George? Well, on, uh, on Sunday, uh, I was uh, recuperating at home. I didn't go to church for the first time in years because I'm sick. I'm still sick. And across the Twitter feed came a uh, story from Azad Marshall, who is the moderator of the Church of Pakistan. He's a member of the GAFCON uh, Primates uh, Council, I believe, or if it's not, he's one of their chief supporters, saying, I've just learned that uh, two priests have been ambushed in Peshawar, which is a northwest frontier uh, or Khyber uh, province, Khyber Peshawar province, I think it is, of Pakistan. And looked into this and found some Pakistani reports and wire services reports. Here's the story. Three men, two priests, one driving, one in the passenger seat, and someone in the rear seat, were driving home from church on Sunday. And they were on Peshawar's Ring Road, which is the, just like most cities have ring roads. And two men on a motorcycle came up beside the car as they're driving on the ring road. And the passenger of the motorcycle, both helmeted and masked, swings out a uh, semi automatic uh, machine gun and sprays the car killing the passenger instantly, wounding the driver. The guy in the rear seat was left unscathed. And these were Christian Anglican priests, one basically killed for his faith, martyred, the other grievously wounded. Um, Archbishop of Canterbury immediately responded, uh, good for Justin. He highlighted the persecution of Christians in this situation. Azad Marshall asked for prayers. Uh, yesterday, uh, Monday, the priest was buried, and a Pakistani government minister, the head of the the, prime, the president's advisors on religious and minority affairs, said that um, this is terrible that Christians are being persecuted. But last week, a Sikh leader was murdered in Pakistan, and the week before that, a Shia leader was murdered, and 
he's saying, and he's basically speaking to a Pakistani audience of Pakistani Sunni Muslims on, on the TV and radio said, look, you are convincing the world that we're religious fanatics. And the fanatics among us are basically destroying the reputation of Islam, giving fuel to the belief that Islam is irrational, evil, and cruel. And this murder and this cruelty has to stop. Um, now, whether he's going to get murdered for espousing moderate Islam in the face of uh, aggressive jihadism, but this partially uh, Pakistani commentators are telling us is the result of the fall of Afghanistan to the Taliban. Well, that's so the one, Taliban, of the problems, well, one of the bigger problems is the Biden administration has left a vacuum in the area. When mm -hmm. we left Afghanistan and left a lot of our armaments there, and and we left some uh, citizens there and some people who helped us over the last 10 to 15 years, uh, we left this power vacuum. And we've learned anything over the last 800 years in the Middle East. You can't leave a power vacuum. It will be filled, and it's usually filled by evil. And that's what's happened now, George. And but Open Doors uh, released a report last week saying that Pakistan, uh, Afghanistan is now past North Korea as the most dangerous place in the world for Christians, which is a quite a remarkable thing if you know anything at all about North Korea, where it's yeah. where you get sentenced to prison, you and your entire family get sentenced to prison if one of you is found to be a Christian. Uh, Afghanistan, they've skipped prison, they just kill you if they find you're a Christian. And the anarchy and the strife and the violence that was, I don't want to say localized in Afghanistan, but was sort of in Afghanistan, is now spilling over into Pakistan. So the Pakistani Christians, and there's two or three million of them, it's not like there are a dozen of them. Are now, and Pakistani Hindus and Pakistani Sikhs and Pakistani Shias um, and Ahmadi Muslims are now being retargeted. It's not that this just never happened before. Uh, All Saints Church, where the uh, fellow was buried yesterday, uh, was the site of a terror bomb that killed over 100 people about eight years ago. It was eight years, yeah. Eight, nine years ago. Remember when we reported it at the time. Yeah. But the there's now with Af with Afghanistan fallen to the Taliban the war is now being brought closer to home to Christians in the region it's bad, it's a difficult situation it is, it, it's miserable and I could say stuff right now that would get me killed and I don't want to but uh, um, I, I really want today to come and we stop having to report uh, in Africa, uh, in Asia uh, about these these atrocities all right let's move on to our next story it's a follow-up story to a follow-up story and this is the follow-up to that follow-up story we reported last year about uh bones or um reported bones being found by ground penetrating radar uh outside some schools in canada run by christian organizations the anglicans roman catholics presbyterians there's a, a bunch of denominations that were employed by the canadian government to educate teach house in many situations indian children from the, the local areas and now years centuries later we're finding what is reported to be mass graves and they said we we have used ground penetrating radar in a couple areas and we found these mass graves of clearly children that were um, abused beaten killed murdered by these schools and buried and we need to, as a nation, apologize for it, as a church, flagellate ourselves for it, um, and as a society, never go back to that type of way again. And then we got reports, maybe some skepticism, uh, that says, you know, nobody remembers that happening. There's no documentation of that happening. And you really need to understand that ground penetrating radar doesn't work that way. It doesn't identify bodies. It identifies anomalies in the ground and you know if you if you use a ground penetrating radar at the wrong time when there's a deep frost in canada you're going to get completely different results and if it's the muddy season or the early permafrost season it's a completely different story so you really have to step back and say that's not evidence that may be an accusation we should look further and george i, I want to take this time to to encourage those who feel they're guilty of this to do an investigation. We know investigations work, 
George Bell over in the UK was thoroughly investigated and today they're trying to um, have a moment where they can reconstitute his name as being good and holy again not holy righteous <laughs> and so i thought is that something we could do for canada or not so why don't we back up and give us the full story here and let's see if we can't find a way forward last year national story in canada that made its way around the world was that mass graves had been found outside of residential schools run by the different churches 19th century, the government paid the major religious groups, Anglicans, Catholics, Presbyterians, and so forth, mm -hmm. to educate, house, feed these children in boarding schools. Now, I'll call them Indians because I'm an American and we refer to them as American Indians. The I know Ukraine an American... and Indians. There's nothing wrong with that. And Canadian American Indians, it, it, we can get too long in the circumlocution. So just. Yes live with it live with me as i use my language forgive us yes uh, and canada went through a period of hysterics with flags nationally being flown at half mass from government buildings church massive burnings. apologies and church burn burnings two three dozen churches uh this all paid into a history of uh collective uh, white guilt about the treatment of indians in canada reparations and truth and reconciliation commissions and and i'm not going to go into all of that but in the past few years this process has been overtaken by professional charlatans the canadian equivalent to the al sharptons of this world race baiters baiters and hucksters and just like the tawana brawley case when it first came out for an american audience turned out to be a complete lie and fabrication it's looking like the story from last summer was a lie and fabrication. And a Canadian professor printed an article, which we reprinted on Anglican Inc., pointing out, for all these dead children, there's no bones, and there's nobody missing from the records. And he said, and he pointed out the historical record, the government paid for these children to be educated, housed, and fed. And the government would send out inspectors to schools to make sure that they were getting their money's worth so that you just didn't write and say, okay, I got 100 kids, but you're only feeding 10, and there are 90 missing. The government made sure they were there. But there are no massive anomalies that would point to the mass die-offs. These schools were not Dickensian uh, DOS houses run by the Canadian Mr. Bumbles of the world. Um, now, of course, bad things did happen. They will always happen in institutions. No well, school, no prison, no... Military. Here, here in America, well, hold on. let's be honest, here in America, we had the Trail of Tears. You know, there have been atrocities to uh, indigenous, native uh, peoples brought upon by us Westerners. We're not denying that. We're trying yeah, to find I mean, evidence in this accusation. And forcing people to move from Florida, Oklahoma is a crime. I, is. I agree I with agree. that. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm making light of a terrible thing. I apologize. Yeah. No, but, yes, but I but, resist. <laughs> Well, so the scientific method was brought to investigate this. Where are the bodies? Where's the historical evidence? And no bodies were ever, have ever been produced from this year of claims of hysteria. Well, we reported on this, and then another story broke in Canada after our story, where the Archbishop of British Columbia in the Yukon, Lynn McNaughton, I believe is her name, made an apology uh, saying about the discovery of bones at St. Joseph's Mission. And she, uh, again, apologized for crimes against the Indians. Here's the problem. What she reported was that somebody has claimed that ground scanning radar has once again licked found bones. But nobody's actually dug these bones up. Mm -hmm. So what she has done is she's jumped to a conclusion without any investigation. The conclusion fits into the white guilt narrative of how horrible we are as a, as a, as a race and all this and that, but there's no evidence of it. And one of my little hobbies, uh, I, I love metalworking and things like that. And you can go onto YouTube and you can see these shows where Russians 
go through these old battlefields and dig up the uh, relics yeah. of the war. Sure. The ground scanning radar finds metal. There is no radar that can find easily biological items. If there were, we'd be seeing it in the commercial market, but there is no such thing. There well, are radars can find anomalies, absolutely. but they cannot say that what Kevin, you, you would describe it. You've got more of a scientific brain. Well, yeah, but it can find anomalies, but what we, we owe it if children were killed in mass in Canada to dig them up and give them proper burial to do an investigation, not just make accusation. We owe it to the children. If we don't find any children, oh, good. What? <laughs> oh, whew, good. <laughs> Dodged a bullet. Nothing wrong here. But if, if we really have a mass grave there, we owe it. We owe it to them to, to have an investigation mm -hmm. and uh, give them proper burials. So, cause, so what happened, the Archbishop of British Columbia did was radar says their bones immediately jumps to the conclusion of genocide and desecration of the Indian bodies. Mm -hmm. The steps that should have been taken were dig up these suspected bones. Are they animal? Are there bones? Or, are it, or is it a mineral deposit of some sort, limestone, things that the glaciers left in an odd place? If they are bones, are they human? Are they animal? If they're human, are they the bones of adult or children? Are they the bones of European? people of European descent or native or Aboriginal peoples? What is the age of the bones? Did these people, were these uh, homesteaders who died in a blizzard 150 years ago? Were these the victims of a serial killer six years ago? And then once a police investigate, then make the, then go forward with what you think happened. But to, go, to jump to the conclusion to debt to fame the people who gave their lives to bring the faith of Jesus Christ to the natives of Northern America, I think is a terrible step forward. Um, yeah, I hope we can report that they do an investigation and we will bring you that report here on Anglican and Unscripted. Um, next one story. The, but Kev, yeah. Kevin, Kevin, one other thing, uh, Ronald Reagan's first Secretary of Labor, I forget his name, was accused of corruption. Mm -hmm. James um, Watt. Uh, and uh, how was Secretary of the Interior? Somebody yeah, else. Yeah, Secretary. Uh, see somebody else. I, I, he, yeah, he 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 yeah. goes. What guy was from New Jersey? Yeah, he, yeah. He, and you know, he was uh, he was a building country. He was in the building business from New Jersey. So of course, and he had an Italian last name. So of course, he's got to be crooked. Well, he went through everything, and he was completely innocent. And after years and hundreds of thousands of dollars in defending himself, and years being painted as a crook. When it was all said and done, he said, where do I go to get my reputation back? Who can give it back to me? Which government department? Who can give back the reputation of the residential school system once a final, a final accounting and investigation is done? Today, there's a conference in Dichester, England, led by Richard Simmons, the head of the, Bell, uh, the George Bell Commission, not the weight loss guru. Um, different Richard Simmons. Yes. And where they're looking at the reputation of George Bell, even after he's been exonerated by historical investigation, legal investigation, the church, and even Justin Welby gave a half-hearted apology. The Diocese of Chichester and the Dean of the Cathedral of Chichester has still not undone the things that they have done mm -hmm. to defame him over the years. So where does George Bell go to get his reputation back? No, yeah, or George Carey. Yeah, I mean, yeah, we, we can make a list, and you know that that's really um, that's sad that we don't do our investigations first before we make our our devastating uh, stain uh, and long lasting uh, accusations. Uh, I got a story here. That's the next story. All right, George, let's move on to our next story, and it's a local story for both you and I. Uh, here in the the Diocese of Central Florida, Bishop Greg Brewer has announced at the uh, annual meeting that uh, he's going to retire. And I thought, Ooh, whoa, I remember uh, Bishop Brewer was uh, at the first GAFCON, a uh, member of GAFCON. He replaced John Howe, who is now a more recent uh, convert to GAFCON. And we should talk about this because in the Episcopal world, this kind of has ramifications. 
of will the Episcopal Church allow this diocese to uh, select and approve its next bishop, or is this going to be, you know, th and I hate to use the word, co is this the nail in the coffin of the diocese because they're not going to let you pick? It's just a lot of inside baseball stuff here. Um, first, you know, kudos for Greg Brewer for uh, being on the right side of many things. I've heard some, you know, discussion about maybe a lack of pastoral skills, and I, John Howe, I can think of the same thing. So it's, <laughs> that's how you pick them down here in Florida. Um, but let's just talk about how this will work in the inside baseball of the Episcopal Church, George. I don't think some people have will say oh well you'll never get another conservative bishop right i i don't think that's true um i've i participated in one search process in springfield and early on it was apparent to me that i was not a fit um evangelical looking at anglo-catholic diocese just culture yeah. wasn't there <laughs> um you say tomato i say tomato but at no time was there any sense or hint that i would uh be uh, shot down because of my views on human sexuality and other issues. Um, that having been said, Central Florida is about uh, 20 times bigger than Springfield. Yes, it is. Um, it's, a, it's a big diocese. It's a growing diocese. Florida's a growing state. Um, but I think what we've seen over the past 30, 40 years that at the end of the day, the bishops really don't matter. Um, no, such I, that uh, I think that's relevant think, in the Episcopal Church. I think the value of having um, a bishop or the episcopacy in the Episcopal Church, ironically, isn't there anymore. It used to be. It used to be a, a, a good place to have a bishop and to have a person who would visit the rural churches and 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 bring the baptism and and you know uh, it, it was just a different dynamic now. The Episcopal Church, certainly at the Episcopacy, has made itself irrelevant, George. The deeper and longer I've gotten into this business, if you will, the more I begin to understand things that I really quite didn't understand. Mm -hmm. And early on, somebody told me, you know, it's much better to be a uh, rector of Trinity Wall Street than it is to be a bishop of Kansas. Um, and in fact, the bishop of Kansas retired to become the rector of Trinity Wall, Wall Street. Street yeah. And what we have is that, you know, you have to, and now I'm going to be speaking in non-theological terms, how it actually works, how the system works. Mm -hmm. You follow the money, you follow the spheres and places of influence. Um, a bishop, his personality and his agenda either is in sync with the diocese or it's not. And if, let's say, Charles Benison, his personality, his politics were in sync with his diocese, but his personality was not. Correct. He was a micromanager and he was a bit of a bastard. And in Philadelphia, they're used to having a bishop who let them do what they wanted to do and sort of they were all mildly on the same team. When Benison tried to interfere in the inner workings of the wealthy and powerful churches who are on side on the issues of women and other issues, that's when he got in trouble. Central Florida is sort of the same way. I'm on side theologically, politically, with Bishop Brewer on almost all the issues. Um, he has his particular hobby horses. He's quite keen on racial reconciliation. Mm -hmm. At his, his sermon to our diocese convention on Saturday, he said he wanted to spend the last 18 months. He retires July of uh, 2023. His successor will be elected in January of 2023. He really wants to focus on recon racial reconciliation and things of that nature. Great, wonderful. Greg yeah. is a native of, of Richmond. Absolutely. Yeah. He's a child of the 60s and 70s, and that is an issue that is alive to him. Kevin and I are the next generation. We're not from Richmond, Virginia, so therefore that doesn't have the uh, resonance. But, you know, it's a worthy goal. That being said, even though Greg and I are in the same uh, on the same team, so to speak, my ministry has very little to do with his office of bishop. He comes to my church once every three years. 
we send him thirty to forty thousand dollars a year in return. So basically, I send him a hundred thousand dollars a visit for two and a half hours, um, and we get a diocesan newspaper, and we read about our deputies' to convention, and that's about it. Um, there is no. We don't have any national church materials. We don't use any national church programs. We're growing leaps and bounds. We've had to figure out on our own how to survive COVID. Um, I, I'll give you an example. A few years ago, I had a parishioner who was mentally unstable who had come to church with a concealed weapon. And he was a former New York State constable who had a license to carry a weapon in New York. Didn't have one in Florida. <laughs> okay. And he was, and he had taken this, he wanted to join our security team. We have armed people at every service. Um, almost all are retired uh, first responders. Sure. And uh, he uh, wanted to prove that he was up to the job. And so during coffee hour, he took out his revolver and tried to show how he could speed load it. Uh, and he flicks open the chamber and all the bullets fall out and he's fumbling to stick them. It was a mess. Barney and Fife, yes. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, the, uh, we had a very smart uh, it's head of security at the time, uh, Marco, who was a retired Miami detective, Miami-Dade police detective, who said, oh, I'm sorry, Dick, we only, we only, only use automatics. We don't use revolvers. And uh, you'll have to go get an automatic and then get it registered with the state. And Marco, whose son is a county deputy in this state, in this county, was going to make damn sure that he didn't get a concealed <laughs> permit weapon. <coughs> well, the, the point the point being, I called the diocese and said, you know, what do I do? How, how can I basically disarm this fellow? Well, the general convention has passed a resolution saying we shouldn't have gun. Okay, fine. I'm going to go ask uh, Catherine Jeffrey Shorey to come and take the guy's pistol away. How do you do it? Mm. Not why. I know why, <laughs> but how? And they had no answer, and I'm still waiting. The, the point being that my, my church is wealthy enough, sophisticated enough, successful enough that it has no need of the diocese. And the diocese only really is there for new church plants who need money, or churches on their last support, or new church plants, uh, or, or churches that are trying to get rid of terrible clergy. They, and this is, if you will, the American Episcopal legacy of, in essence, I can do whatever I want here with really no blowback so long as I don't violate civil or criminal laws. Well, you just, you, by diet, your, sto your story proves that you, you're not giving them protection money if they can't protect your, your, your gun policy. So, uh, no, I mean, yeah. the. But, but the, so people say, oh, well, you're going to get a bishop who'll force you to do X, Y, and Z. Well, we have one parish, uh, the parish that the Disney employees go to, uh, St. Richard's, yes. that wants to do gay weddings. And Bishop Brewer has uh, basically allowed the Bishop of uh, Lexington, Kentucky, to oversee them. And they have a retired associate there who's a partnered gay man. Now, nobody has told the diocese this. Um, that we don't, in other words, we don't know this. Bishop Brewer hasn't really trumpeted this from the house tops that he's made this accommodation. And the net result is that everybody thinks things are fine, but we do have an outlier. The next person along will probably do the don't ask, don't tell policy that Bishop Brewer has been doing. Yeah. But yeah. so long as he's not, so long as we're not told to do something and compelled, um, you know, we had mass mandates. The bishop had mass mandates and all these rules and regulations. And basically, people followed the ones they liked and ignored the ones they didn't like. That's, that's, that's and, so Florida. That That's very Florida. Um, let's move on and talk about some other news real quick here. Um, and we're going to, you know, they just had the March for Life up in uh, uh, D.C. And if you know Anglicans for Life, they're there every year as well. And it's a great chance to talk about the life cycle quick here of Anglican TV. Anglican TV, over the last 15 years, has showed up to Anglicans for Life and Bishop Consecrations and events around the world and filmed them, and we put them on YouTube. And a lot of this audiences know 
is now, <laughs> does not know that uh, Anglican TV existed before Anglican Unscripted. And there's plenty of videos you can go and watch of all these events that happened over the years. And I'm going to provide a link in the, in the show notes here of how to look at all those playlists. And you can go and watch conferences where um, Bishop Ackerman from Forward and Faith gave uh, wonderful teachings. Bishop Duncan gave wonderful teachings. Archbishop Duncan. Uh, just there's a whole plethora of videos. COVID and the advancement of technology in all these churches and dioceses around the country and the world means that I don't have to be the only camera guy. I'm not flying to Egypt. I'm not flying to Alexandria, to Singapore, and doing all this videotaping because now everybody has cameras. For me, COVID was good. It, it helped take uh, Anglican TV to a new life cycle where we just produce more and more Anglican scripted and in-house um, things and, and link to other people's videos. We, we don't, uh, I, I don't mind not sitting in a 23-hour plane seat to Singapore. No, no no questions asked. So I'm going to provide a show note to that. But we also want to hi highlight March for Life because right before the Supreme Court is the discussion of Roe v. Wade and whether it is good law or bad law in relationship to a new law in Texas. And this may be, because Roe v. Wade technically is a very bad law, the last uh, time we march for life on the other side of the topic. We may be marching for life as a, a, a nation uh, that is pro-life for a while until states change their laws, George. Well, what we'll find, uh, I believe, is that if Roe versus Wade is overturned, it's not going to be the titanic change that mm -hmm. partisans on the extremes on both sides think it will be. California will immediately legalize abortion. Mm -hmm. Uh, just as and you know, we'll have California, New York, a bunch of other states like that where you can have abortion up to birth, and other states like Florida will basically criminalize abortion where you cannot have abortion under any circum except it, it, you know there'll be you know for the danger of the mother's life sure. and things of that nature, and basically, we'll what will happen I think is that we'll have some woke companies like Google will say. Uh, we're not going to have any business meetings in Florida because they don't allow abortions. And the Episcopal Church will refuse to hold conventions in Florida because it's the, this and that. Um, we'll only have them in Montpelier, Vermont, New York City, and in Anaheim, California. So what we're going to, we're basically, it's going to go back to the states. And the different characters of the states will come forward. And those states where the majority of the population through the legislature does not want to have abortion, will not have abortion. Those states where the majority of the population through the legislature will legalize it. It's and interesting because... So you poll, still will poll. have people marching for life because there'll still be children being killed in New York. But they won't California. be marching over Roe versus Wade. They'll be marching more at different states and states levels. 70% of the population, male and female, agree that there should be abortion restrictions. Mm -hmm. uh, to one degree or another. That's pretty good. Okay, I, you know, that, that's that's a, higher than I thought it would be. So you're going to find, like George said, some states are going to be, you know, uh, birth to two years old. That, that, that's what, <laughs> we'll, we'll take care of that child for you. Um, others will be, you know, maybe first trimester, maybe first two weeks, maybe, you know. So, but, but I think where I was going in my little, in my little head was that the work of Anglicans for Life will continue, absolutely, even if Roe versus Wade is overturned, because there will need to be continued education to basically change the culture and the minds of people to see that abortion is not an issue of a woman's right to choose, it's an issue of life. And the argument needs to be made, it needs to be pursued, and that's the true, the true mission of Anglicans for Life and other organizations like that isn't so much to sway Supreme Court justices, but to sway the hearts and minds of people to see what God's will is and God's plan in this work. And that job is never going to end. Now, my favorite part of Anglicans for Life is it covers both sides, uh, you know, the, the dying age as well. 
and knowing your rights mm-hmm. and responsibilities and uh, just how to deal with the, the medical professionals when you are at the end stages of life. So it's not just the beginning, it's the end as, as well. And, uh, I'm a big supporter of Anglicans for Life and uh, uh, keep going strong, guys. Um, is that everything, George? Uh, I have one last thing. We shall finish with the Episcopal Church and voting rights and dipping their toes into politics again, George. What's what's the story there? Well, the Executive Council met last week uh, via Zoom in Cleveland, and it kicked off with uh, with Michael Curry, the presiding bishop, giving an impassioned speech on voting rights. And he went from the uh, generic to the specific, where eventually he zeroed in on how we should pass the Biden administration and the Democratic Party's voting rights. And you can agree with the first three quarters that the right of all people to vote and it's part of our democracy, all that. Sure. But then, then, as the Episcopal does, so church does so often its leadership, it moves from common sense to the comical of basically uh, equating what a particular political party or leader wants to do with God's will. So, you know, fighting ballot, you know, fighting voter fraud is contrary, is, is not what Jesus would do. Jesus would allow same day registration with no idea, ID, uh, sort of arguments. And Maybe a generation ago, this would have been uh, an issue that would have made the press. It only, it didn't, it barely made Anglican Inc. Made the Episcopal News Service. It made what? Anglican Inc. because we're forced to do this. But it had no ripple in the wider secular world. And the answer is nobody cares what the executive, just like we made a joke about Vladimir Putin quaking in his boots because the Episcopal Church said, don't invade Iran, uh, Ukraine. I surrender. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't think the Republicans in Congress or uh, West Virginia Governor Manchin uh, is going to change his mind because Michael Curry says vote uh, to allow same day registration and have a federal uh, usurpation of states' rights on election laws. Well, but we already have. Here's the biggest problem, George. In 1965, August 8th, you guys can check me on this. The United States passed the Voters' Right Voters Right Act. Okay, we have an act at the federal level that protects everybody's right to vote, largely in response to Jim Crow laws. And you can. It, it would be very difficult to improve upon that because it recognizes everybody as equal and everybody has an equal right to vote. That's what we want. Well, we want people to mail in votes. Uh, we don't want people to have to prove who they are. Uh, you know, no, just don't complicate things. So, yeah, that's our last story. But I think what is so sad, let's take the issue to one side. Uh, I really can't get worked up over the issue because I think it's sort of stupid. Um, it, it's a stupid ditch for the Episcopal Church to want to die in. But hey, that's the ditch they've chosen. And it's not something that I can really work up enough moral indignation on. For me, it, there's just a sadness that a once great institution, an institution whose leaders, uh, you know, Franklin Roosevelt talked to the Bishop of Albany uh, shortly after Pearl Harbor, uh, about uh, America entering the war. Yeah. Do you think? Do you think that Joe Biden will call the Bishop of Delaware with his thoughts about the Ukraine? Not with a, the a huge Church, donation. The Episcopal Church's job, as if you will, the moral conscience, the the confessor, the priest, to the establishment, the elite, that has been gone ever since uh, the 1960s. Absolutely. And it's gone further into irrelevance. And, in, and so for me, let, let me take it home. Let me take sure. it home. It's like a sermon. I'm bringing it back to Jesus. Wait, wait, swing that bat, George. The, 
the success, the parishes that I see that are successful are those that live and breathe the good news of Jesus Christ. Um, not those that involve in politics. Gavin Ashenden, Ashenden's law is that the more a church talks about politics, the less spiritual it is. Party politics. Absolutely. And with the Episcopal Church, he had in mind the uh, Tory and the Labour parties in England, but he could have the Episcopal Church in mind with that. Mm. The, uh, the total irrelevance of so much that goes on above our heads in the hierarchy um, it's all part of the coming I think it's all part of I think a coming revolution we're going to see I think all this facade is going to fall apart there's no need to jump ship because the ship is going to sink underneath us so we might as well float in our lounge chair instead of trying to <laughs> jump I, in another uh, ship you know, or the ship has already sunk. Lots of different analogies there. Indeed. This has been episode... Well, I'll let you do that one. I'm Kevin Carlson. And I'm George Conger. And Jesus is still in charge. Amen. And the world is not going to end until he comes again. And Sometime we need tomorrow. not worry. Yes. <laughs> we need not worry about the inanities of the, the moment. But this is episode 715 of Anglican on the screen.